So we're continuing the margin series, and I, I shared with you guys last week, if you were here, I really confess to saying margin's not something I do well. And so there will be times at which I will get up here and I will talk about things that I greatly struggle with, I'll challenge you to do some things, and then it's kind of this way I keep myself accountable to a whole lot of people, uh, which could be bad, especially if I don't carry out what I'm kind of asking you guys to commit to. And so, so that's going to happen, that's going to happen this morning. In, in every relationship that all of us are in and have ever been in with another human, it doesn't matter if it's a, like a, a significant other kind of relationship or an employee-employer relationship or, or if it's like you're, you're the person uh, checking out the grocery store and, and there's someone that's checking you out at the grocery store. And, and I always wonder, like, how do they know all the vegetable codes? You ever thought that? Like, you ever, have you ever been with that, that person checking you out and they know all the codes? And like, do you know how many fruits and vegetables are? It's amazing. And so I don't care, tangents up, I don't care what the relationship is. At a minimum, every relationship, the close ones, the distant ones, have this at a minimum. Person A does something for person B in a relationship, and person B does something for person A. Always, right? So if you take the employer-employee relationship, and they're not friends at all, they don't want to be friends, um, basically, here's what they're at least getting from each other, right? Uh, the employer is getting some, some productivity, some work, some time, some effort from the employee, an employee is receiving, hopefully, payment from the employer, right? And so at a minimum, they're both doing something for each other, right? When I do check out at Safeway, uh, right, the, the, the person behind me, I, or Safeway in general, I, I'm paying them for something, in return, they are giving me something. So there's this, I do for you, you do for me kind of situation. Even in the closest relationships, like my marriage with Shauna, she she does things for me. We, we finish dinner, and, and, and we get our kids to bed pretty early, and so there's not a big window of time, and so the dishes have to be cleaned, and the boys have to be clean. And generally, I take whichever one's uh, not as dirty as, as the other, right? It's like, I don't know, if we've had lasagna or some of the, you know those dishes that stick to the pan, you're like, oh, I'm going to take the boys. Uh, but I do things for her, and she does things for me in the relationship. But here's the thing uh, about really personal relationships. It, when those are deduced to just, I do for you and you do for me, we're missing out on the heart of the relationship that's been offered, right? I didn't fall in love with Shauna so she would do a bunch of things for me. Right? I'm glad she does. I need her to do some things for me. She hopefully didn't fall in love with me because she wants me just to do some things for her. We, there's a sense, the heart of the relationship is that she and I love being together. Right? I mean, you have those days where you don't, right? Let's be honest. Days where you don't, I'm like, uh, I'm going on vacation, I'm going by myself. Right? But, but you, at the heart of our relationship, we enjoy each other's presence. So while a lot of our, especially with kids and busy lives and baseball season starting today, there's a lot of this go back and forth. Like, I need you to do this, I need you to do this, and can you take this here, can you make sure this email gets sent out? All these kind of things come together, but that isn't what our relationship hopefully is built upon. It's hopefully built upon, like, we enjoy one another's presence. With all the quirkiness that each other brings, with all the imperfection that we bring, we enjoy one another's presence. Well, here's my point for today. I want to get after really quickly what I think many of us perhaps are missing out on in this room. Some of us in this room, when it comes to our faith, and whether wherever you would say you are on the faith journey, when it comes to a relationship with God, or however you want to characterize that, for many of us in this room, it's literally been deduced to this, God does for me, and I do for Him. And there's a lot of doing, right? And even with God, at a minimum, that's, that is involved in a relationship. God has done for us, right? I mean, He dies on the cross through the person of Jesus. God has blessed you. God has allowed you to be here in some way, whether you walked, whether you took the bark, whether you took uh, the bus, whether you drove here, uh, if you got piggyback right here. I mean, however you got to church this morning, God provided you a way to be in the room this morning, whether you're, you're happy about that or not. But for many of us, and in all of us, I think in some seasons of our life, our relationship with God has really been minimized to this. God does for me, and I do for Him, and there's a whole lot of doing. But if that's the case for any of us, I think we're missing out on the heart of the relationship that God's offered us. The heart of the relationship that God's invited us to. Right? How long has it been? And don't raise your hand or say out loud. And maybe the word answer is never. How long has it been since you just enjoyed being in the presence of God, allowing Him to do something with your soul? How long has it been? Two aims that I have for this morning. My first aim is that you and I would see the value that the Creator God has invited us into a personal relationship with Him. That you would see the value of that and how important it is and not just the I do for Him and He does for me kind of relationship. The second thing is that you would value it so much that you would fight off everything that wars against it. All right? And understand this about values. I teach, when, I, when I coach people through life uh, decisions, whether it's their jobs or it's my staff or it's even my own family, my boys, here's what I, here, I, I, I'm a big proponent of values-based decision making, which is this. Whatever you value the most, you will do whatever it takes to protect it or to get it. 
right? Now, we can say we value a lot of other things, right? But whatever it is, think about even when you struggle with some sin in your life, right? You didn't care where you had to go to get it, right? You didn't care what time you had to stay up to to achieve it. You didn't care who you had to hide it from. You didn't care how far you had to drive. Whatever it is that you want, whatever it is that you really value, you will fight everything else and make sure that you get to do that. But what happens for many of us, we live with good intentions, but we don't actually allow our values to be lived out in how we spend our time, how we spend our energy, how we spend our attention and our focus. And so this morning, here's what I want to do. I want to invite you and me to see that there is more to a relationship with God than just Him doing for you, though He's going to do for you. Okay, I believe that. He's done enough. If He doesn't do anything else, He's, he's, he's pretty good on that end. And He's going to ask you to do things for Him, right? He wants you to give your life to Him. He wants you to, to, to spend your time in ways that are going to honor Him. He wants you to, to, to make an impact with your one life and, and the world that you live in for the sake of His kingdom and the furthering of His mission. He wants you to do. You're going to hear me stand on this platform a lot. You guys that have been around me, you know I'm going to talk about doing a lot. You know, I, I am a doer by nature. I get bored easily. I want things to happen, right? I want to get after it. But if that's the only thing that is a part of our relationship with God, then we're going to miss out big time. So I want to invite you to open up your Bibles, if you have one, to Luke chapter 10. If you don't have one, raise your hand. Our lovely volunteers are going to put one in your hands right now. Just keep your hands up high, and they will give you this Bible. It's yours, uh, just, it's yours as a gift. Do with it uh, mostly whatever you want. So if, if, if the relationship with God for you, like if, if somebody said, hey, would you classify that for yourself? Like, would you, if it's just that I do for him and he does for me, then you're missing out on what the heart of the relationship is. But here's the reality with the margin tie-in. However, you can't enjoy the heart of any relationship without margin, right? Let, let's think about that now. Some of you are in significant relationship. Raise your hand if you're, like, and this is where we're going to set up all the single people, actually. Um, raise your hand. No, stand up. No, don't raise your hand. I'm not going to do that. We're not going to single you out, all right? Um, we, we, we've got a way we're going to get you guys connected as singles, but just hold on. Um, none of you that are in a significant relationship right now, whether you're married or you've just been dating a long time or even a while, but you'd say it's pretty serious. Of course, she might not say it's serious, but you think it's very serious, right? Um, in that relationship, you, um, my guess is that you didn't get into the relationship and didn't get into the depth of the relationship simply because you did for that person and they did for you. My guess is that you stayed up later than you needed to, to chat. My guess is that you didn't even work some days just so you could see them. My guess is that you planned things, and when they said, hey, what do you want to do? Some of you, right, and don't confess, men, don't, don't lose your macho this year. Some of you are just like, I just want to be with you, baby. Right, <laughs> fellas? The truth was, ladies, he did want to be with you. He also had no money, right? And so he's just like, I just want to be together. I don't need to eat. Hopefully you don't either. I just need to be with you, right? That's, that's how our relationships get developed. None of us begin relationship, hey, do for me, I'll do for you. But, but all of us drift into that. There are times in which Sean and I seem like we just have this contract or, or partnership. And it is that in, in some extent. But it's got to go further. There are times where it's just like, she's doing all these things for me. I'm doing all these things for her. And we don't even spend time together unless we're doing it. And God has something different for us. So Luke chapter 10, if you have a gift Bible, I think we're on page uh, 564. If you, uh, and we're in verse 38 through 42. Would you guys stand as we read this together? Maybe a classic story if, if, if you've spent much time in the Bible, but I think there's so much for us living in the city, living in the culture we are, being people that are driven. Uh, I just think there's something here for us. And then we're going to leave with some challenges this morning that are going to be difficult, uh, but, but we transform our lives if we take them. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Here's what Luke, the, the, the writer of this uh, letter said. He says, now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him, that's to Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. You may be seated. It's always fun if we can to approach a story as if we're reading it for the first time. And, and, and maybe some of you are hearing this story for the first time. And so you, you have a situation where Jesus has been traveling with his disciples and he, he moves into this village for, the, for the, this time and, 
And it says that he comes into the home of Martha, and Martha welcomes him in. So she's, she's kind of doing the hospitality thing. She's not telling him, like, oh, it's dirty when really, right? When you tell us your house is dirty, what you're basically telling us, I just don't want you in my house, right? Is that true? I mean, you're like, well, we haven't done the dishes in forever, and the clothes are everywhere. The reality is you just don't want us to come in. That, that's okay. Martha doesn't pull that with Jesus. She welcomes Jesus into her home, and then it says that she has a sister named Mary. We'll get to her later. It says in verse 40, Martha was distracted with much serving. Martha wanted to do some things for Jesus. Is, is there anything wrong with that? Right? Is, is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. In fact, you'll hear me say all the time, hey, what are you giving your life to that's really going to matter in the end? What has God wired you with? What God puts in you, He wants to bring out. What are the gifts, talents, skills, passions, experiences you have? God wants you to leverage those for the sake of His kingdom. He wants you to do some great things for Him and for His kingdom. You hear that a lot in this room. You hear that a whole lot. It's what I, it's my bent, it's my slant, it's what I lean towards, it's my go-to. If somebody says, hey, we'd love to talk to your, we'd love for you to talk to our, our group, and so they'll find me here or there. The one thing that I want to get at is, hey, what are you giving your life to? That, that's a big thing for me. Big, big deal. Martha is not necessarily having bad desires. She's not having a bad desire. She wants to do something for Jesus. But there's more to the thing with Jesus, the relationship with Jesus, and just the doing. There's more available to you and I this morning in our relationship with God than just, than just the doing. She wants to do something, and it's so interesting. Mary, her sister, she's just sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Him teach. In Martha's mind, who's got it wrong? Not rhetorical. Oh. <laughs> Mary. Mary. Yeah, Mary, come on! I just needed the South African voice back there in the back to, to add a little spice to it. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, and in Martha's mind, she's not just she's not wondering which one of us is right. She's convinced. Uh, think about times when you're working on a team or with a group of people, whether it's in school or at the office, and, and, and you're obviously are the one who's dominating the group, right? I mean, you're, you're, no one's bringing the energy and work ethic to the table that you are. Think, what are your thoughts about people that are, that are not bringing it like you are, honestly? I mean, don't cuss in church, but honestly, what do you mean? They're lazy. They're lazy? Yeah. What else? They need to help. They, they what? They need to help. They need to help. What is their deal? But here's what's interesting. We don't want them to be quite as busy as us, because we still need that card to play, don't we? <laughs> right? Like, man, you had 17 appointments today? That's awesome. But I had 18. Right? I mean, we, we want to make sure that they're bringing it to the table. We want to make sure that they're not bringing it quite as much, at least in appearance, as we are. We think of them as lazy. We think there's a huge problem. And that's what Martha's thinking, obviously, about Mary. Now, Martha is in the kitchen, and she is, I mean, she's probably making Jesus' favorite meal, right, if she's gotten word on the street. She's either making his favorite meal, she knows it, or she's making the meal that she's best at. For some reason, when we have people over to our house, and some of you can attest to this, Sean always tries new things. Like, literally, we've never had them before. And, and it, it, it's been working mostly. Like, seriously, it's been working. We're not throwing stuff out. And it, it's been working, but, but my thought is, like, when you have a, a person you want to kind of impress, you better have your thing. If your thing's ice cream or whatever is the thing that you make, right? Um, and i got some great ice cream makers I can point you to uh, in the room this morning. Whatever your thing is, you want to make it, like, talk to me about what your favorite thing that your significant other cooks, guys or girls. And if you say nothing, you might get beheaded today, all right? <laughs> Come on, what, what do you love to eat that, that, your, that your spouse or significant other roommate Turkey cooks? Burgers. What? Burgers. Turkey burgers. Great. What else? Cereal. Cereal. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's love. I throw questions out like this so that I can make a little money on the side counseling. It's kind of like, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divide the family and then I'm going to get back and, uh, and, and make it happen. Cereal, that's awesome. And we're going to move right along. Uh, but you have to think that Martha is really, in really intent on making something that she thinks is going to work. Like it is going to be awesome. Jesus is going to love it. He's going to like. I'm going to. I'm going to get a special place in heaven. It's a pretty big deal, right? I mean, it's one thing to cook for someone important, but she's like, first meal for Jesus. What are you? What are you going to do? And Mary's like, I'm good right here. And Martha, you know, how, how many of you, like, when you want to say something to someone, even though it's not really your personality, something begins to just boil within you and, and, and stuff's out of your mouth before you even realize it? Anybody? That's what's happening here. Now, we know Martha's got some issue directed toward Mary. She'd have to, right? But, she, but what's recorded in the text, she's not speaking really against Mary doing something wrong. Who's she speaking to? Jesus. Don't you care? She's like, no, not really. I'm good. And she, Jesus, do you care? 
Do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Martha, I mean, she's you know, kind of like Peter, right? I mean, she's, she's got it on her mind. It's coming out of the mouth. And she says to Jesus, Jesus, you, there's an issue here. And um, here, here's, the, here's the issue. We, we need some help. We need some help. Hey, if you guys can make space, there's people still coming in. Come on in, guys. We're just getting to the good part. Seriously. Um, if we can make some space in the back or scoot over to the middle, we're going to... I'm just trying to... I've paid people so you'll be convinced we need to add the 6 o'clock service. So, guys, <laughs> guys and girls, seriously, come on in and have a seat. We're just getting into this whole idea of Luke chapter 10, Martha and Mary. And Martha is wanting Jesus to say, hey, Mary, get off your tail and get in the kitchen. That's what Martha wants. She wants Jesus to go, Mary, you've got a problem. You need to get in here. Uh, go, go to the kitchen. And Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus says, Martha, Mary's, the, she doesn't have the issue. She doesn't have the problem. It's not her thing. Martha, you, sweetheart, are distracted and you're anxious about many things. You're troubled about many things. And then he goes, but one thing is necessary. So you have, you have Martha over here, and then her whole intent is, I've got to produce, I've got to produce, I've got to make it happen, I've got to make it happen. And so she's making it happen. All, all the time she's getting jealous that Mary's not in here making it happen. Right? You, you've got to make it happen. And Mary's doing one thing. She's not so consumed with all these other things. And Jesus says, Martha, you are troubled about many things. So many things over here, lots of things going on, lots of things that Martha assumes must be necessary. And Mary's doing one thing, and Jesus says, but, but one thing is necessary. Essentially, Mary's chosen what's necessary, and I will never remove that from her. Now, let's understand this. Because some of you are like, man, is Jesus advocating laziness? Uh, read about his life. Read about him getting up early in the morning, going to bed late, no place to lay his head. He's not advocating laziness. And, and one thing you, you and I need to understand is that that, that Martha thinks that Mary has no idea what she should be doing. And the reality is, Martha has no clue what she's missing out on. Not, not a clue. Why would that be significant? Why would that be important? Why would that be more important? That, that, that's the one necessary thing? How's that possible? Now let me say this. God is not anti-work before you head down that path. In fact, guess who created work? Guess who Scripture records as the first worker? He was fairly productive, right? <laughs> Let there be light. <laughs> Let some animals crawl. He, he did okay. He got his stuff done, didn't he? I'm sure there was stuff left on the to-do list, but he, he was pretty, pretty efficient, right? Pretty, pretty productive. God invented work. He's the first one working. He's making things. He's doing things, pr producing things. He is not anti-work. And when it comes to us, God has given you both, I think, a mind and a body, and He wants you to work. He wants you to be productive. He wants you to get it done. Now make sure you're being productive in the, in the right way. Make sure you're getting done the right kinds of things. But God wants you to work. God is not anti-work. He's given you your body to work. He's given you your mind to work. But He's also given you a soul. And it's interesting when somebody says, hey, are you, are you healthy again? We always answer that question in light of our physical health. Right? It's a thing that we can't escape. It's a thing that other people see on us. Right? But none of us in this room can look at each other necessarily and tell whose soul is exhausted this morning. Right? I can put the game face on. Who knows? You can put the game face on. Who knows? I can, you know, I've had bags under my eyes and I say it too late. You can see where I'm physically exhausted. You have no idea what the condition of my soul. I have no idea what the condition of your soul is. And we keep going. We always keep paying attention to the externals. Right? Because the reality is, some of us, we say this a lot, especially with the makeup of most of the people in our church, the reality is that some of us would love for God to give us a to-do list, even if there were a thousand things on there, we'd get after it, wouldn't we? Some of you would be done before you went to sleep tonight. But He's not giving you just a list, hey, do this, be productive, and then you and I are good. God doesn't want just that I do for you, you do for me relationship. He wants us to get at the heart of what it means to be in His presence, to sit with Him, to, to read His Word, to get reflections of what He's doing in our life. Because here's what happens. Business without perspective happens a lot. So here, here's how this could work. So let's say that, that five years ago, um, you, were, you were doing the kind of things we're going to talk about today. You were taking time out of your schedule. You were reflecting. You were seeing what God had to say in the Bible. You, you were praying through things. And God gave you a vision. 
So you got the vision, and then for the next five years, we've all fallen into this, I think. For the next five years, you just got busy pursuing the vision. And some of you haven't even gotten up, put your head up out of the water to take a breath and look in to see if that's still the thing he has for you. The worst thing in the world won't be getting to the end of our lives and realizing how busy we were with our lives, but it could be realizing how busy we were with the wrong things. If you don't pull away, if you don't step aside, if you don't release yourself, even from your computer, and I know you're important, I know if you don't see the email, the world will fall apart. I got it. I know. But if you never pull away, then who has a clue if the thing that they're being productive with and busy with is even the thing God still has for them? I can't. Otherwise, if I don't do that as a leader of this church, guess what programs we're going to be doing 10 years from now? Everything like we're doing right now. I'm not saying that isn't what God has for us, but I don't have a clue if I don't pull away, kind of get above big picture, not just of our church, but of my own life, and get aside and go, okay, what do I need to do? You know, this, this whole idea of Sabbath, that, that maybe you're familiar with that term, um, and our Jewish friends really do this well. And part of it, they, they've stuck with this. And I know some things we may go, well, that's impossible for me or, or whatever. But the idea of Sabbath really comes right at the beginning of creation. God works, He produces, He creates for six days. And then on the day seventh, He, he rests from His work, right? He takes a Sabbath. And then the Sabbath even shows up. We don't like to think of this as one of the Ten Commandments, but it is one of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? To keep the Sabbath holy. To keep the Sabbath holy. Holy. Here's what Ruth Haley Barton, a great lady who writes about spiritual disciplines, here's what she says in her book, Sacred Rhythms. She says, and this is a great reminder, it's kind of why we do Sabbath and why we get soul nourishment from God. She says, I am not God. God is the one who can be all things to all people. God is the one who can be two places at once. God is the one who never sleeps. I am not. This morning, you're, you may feel over the next few minutes a bit devalued, but I just want you to see what the real value is, okay? All right, so stick with me on that. Some of us think that if we don't stay up and get it done, the world's going to fall apart. And here's where I'm going to depress you a little bit, all right? The thing that you're giving all of your time, thought, and effort to, one day it's probably going to be extinct. Some of you are like, no, not me. That, that's what the VCR guy said. <laughs> that's what the cassette player guy said. These things will last forever. That's what Circuit City said. <laughs> right? An Oldsmobile. The guy who made the supercomputer. Man. Feeling depressed yet? <laughs> God wants you to do whatever he's called you to do. He wants you to do it with excellence. But he also wants you to pay attention to and give time to and give space to and sometimes even days to your soul. Why, you and I have our body and mind, and all of that's going with us when we leave this life into the next life. Part of what I believe that Jesus says to Mary, this is the one thing that's necessary, because what Mary's doing there is the only thing that will sustain her for an eternity. Communing with God, right? And listen, I, I don't want you to devalue your own work, but if I, want to, I want to say this. None of you are keeping the world going. None of you are spinning the earth. You may have been, you don't understand, in my industry, or been to get the business off the ground. Guys, I get it. Listen, let's sit down and talk shop. I'm consumed with this. Somebody asked me the other day, hey, when's the last day that you didn't think anything about this church? I was like, I don't know what day did God give me the vision. It, it, it becomes consuming, right? It's my life. I, get, I mean, people are like, well, what's your hobby? What do you read for fun? I read church leadership for fun. I'm not as boring as Tim. He reads about church tax law for fun. That's a different story completely. But just, I'm with you. I get it. You're like, man, you don't understand. Start from from scratch. You're rather than just kidding. I get it. But Ben, you don't understand. The list is so long. Mine too. The list was long for Martha. Mary said, mm, for this moment, I'm going to forget the list. And Jesus says to her, you've chosen the good portion. You've chosen the one thing that's necessary. Here's how I want to end this morning. I want to end by giving you guys what I'm simply calling a Sabbath experiment. And on your communication card that you guys have, you'll have a chance to write this in in the blank. I think it's on the bottom right corner or so of your, of your communication card envelope. So here, here's what I want to do. I want to lay out some things that I'm going to try to adhere to. None of us are going to get it perfect. Don't have to feel guilty if we don't. 
but just something that if we're, because remember what we said last week, if we're not intentional, overload happens in our life automatically, but margin takes intention and it takes effort. And so here's what I want you to do. And when I talk about a Sabbath time, what I mean is, is space away from the things called computers, phones, unless it's an emergency, if that's too tempting, just give your phone to somebody else, all right? And they'll tell you about all the really important emails you get that day, I promise. Phones away, and I'm thinking, for me, it's like a Bible journal, a good walk somewhere in the city, Presidio is what I enjoyed the other day, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but I'm just getting away, being in the midst of God's creation, but remember, that's not the soul nourishment alone, we need to engage in or commune with God. So I'm going to give you daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annually, let's look at some of the things that I think we would do well to strive after. The first one is daily. So daily, I would encourage you, if you want to take the Sabbath experiment, here's the daily challenge. At least 30 minutes a day, spending time alone with God, reading, praying, reflecting, slash journaling, at least five days a week, all right? So if you miss a couple days or something, you know, if, you, if, if you're alarmed, if, if it's another day when your alarm didn't work, all right, um, then, then forgive it, all right? It's, it's okay. Um, here, here's what that looks like for me, okay? I have a black moleskin journal that I record everything in, uh, and so literally you could... Uh, really black me well with my journals, but um, I have three pages that I usually adhere to e each morning. So Sean and I get up at six, and we have a rule that if the boys wake up before seven, they can't come into the living room, all right? If they're bleeding or something, all right, <laughs> put God on the back burner for a moment. Um, no, really, if they have an emergency, we'll, we'll deal with that, but, but otherwise, we tell them, hey, here's some books for you, go read your Bible, go read this, go, go watch this, whatever. Um, and so, alarm goes off for us at 6. I know that's not super early for some of you. For some of you, you didn't know there was a 6 a.m. I got that. Um, and she and I go to the living room. She brews the coffee, makes a cup of coffee. Um, I sit on one couch. She sits on the other couch. Sometimes we're interacting. We're not hard and fast about it. And for me, it's usually reading a chapter 2 from the scriptures. Right now, I'm reading in the book of Matthew. Um, and my three pages in my journal are for this. One page is for the reflections from the text that I'm reading. It's just really helpful for me to engage a little bit with, with what I'm reading. The second page is just a, my prayers for the day. Sometimes relegated, like derived from what the text is about. Sometimes just from life circumstance. And my third page is my distraction page. So things that come into my mind that I don't want to be a part of that time. If I don't write them down personally, they will stay in my mind. So I write them down and I know that, listen, the day is long. I will get to it at 8 o'clock when I get to the office or, or whenever that is. So that's, that's a little bit for me. So it's just 30 minutes. It's that daily. It's not as big as what I'm going to talk about in a moment. And it's certainly a lot more frequent than the other things I'm going to bring up, but I think that's just a great uh, ideal to shoot for. Let's look at the weekly. Weekly, block out at least three hours. And again, if you don't do this ahead of time on your calendar, you're not just going to get to a point where you don't have anything to do. So this becomes the thing that you do at some point in time. Um, for me, this past Friday, and listen, part of what you have to do, depending on your relational status and just your season of life that you're in, you're going to have to be um, be honest with people that are that are in your life to help you, especially if there are children involved. So Friday, what happened for us is I spent the morning with Asher, our four-year-old, who's still at home, and Shauna was able to have some time to herself. Three of us had lunch together, and then I was able to spend the afternoon. I went to the Presidio, kind of got in the wooded area, and uh, thought about things like Friday the 13th, and then came out of the wood, wooded area. Um, <laughs> it was fun. It was daylight. It was all good, I think. Um, and so I just had a three-hour block. Just, I just took my journal, took a Bible, took a, a, a book that I'm reading, and just, just literally in the beautiful creation, just going, hey, let me evaluate and reflect on where my life is right now. And so I began to think about some categories. How do I feel like my relationship is with God? Is it just that He does for me and I do for Him thing? Or, or, or am I actually enjoying it? Remember, 1 John 3, 1 says, How great is the love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God. If someone's lavishing something on you, but you're running, it's not going to get on you, right? Sometimes we just need to sit in that and soak it and receive it. And again, I'm a doer. Literally, my wife took me to an all-inclusive resort this summer, and her, her fear was the whole time that I wouldn't be able to just sit still. Um, because I'm, I'm a doer. So I'm, I'm not willing to go the cruise route yet because I'm afraid of that. Um, sitting still and not being able to do anything about it. Um, and I know everybody's convinced me otherwise. So I just, I just kind of walk, take a walk. Journal your thoughts. Um, you know, be around, whatever it is that energizes you. But remember, those things aren't what we want to nourish us, right? Flowers won't nourish us alone. Uh, the stars at night won't nourish us alone. We need to engage with God in those moments who's made those things that we love, but we're not engaging with those things. We're engaging with the God of those things, all right? But those things can certainly um, heighten our awareness of God and those kind of things. Here, here's, here's what I want you to strive for on a monthly basis. Same thing, but instead of three hours, like we, I'm not urging you and I to do weekly, an eight-hour time where you just unplug from everything and you engage and just think about, okay, God... Just, just reflect on who God is, right? Read the Bible, and as you learn things about God, as you learn about His character, as you learn about Him being all-powerful, as you learn about Him being incredibly loving, as you learn Him being the God who provides, just spend time worshiping Him as such, engaging 
with him, just like you would do with another person, right? Not always doing things for him, but just communicate. The Bible says that for all of us who have placed our faith in Jesus, God sends his Holy Spirit to live inside of us, by which we are able to connect with God in our soul. Now, if you know me, I'm not much into the whole mysticism thing, and this is a bit mystic, but it's a reality, the daily reality that I'm able to and you're able to live in. So, pretty incredible. Here's what I want to encourage you. It's going to get harder, all right? Quarterly, I think this would be a great plan to, to have one of these sessions over 24 hours. And again, you can enjoy this. You don't have to be alone. You can bring a friend into this as long as they know the rules, right? No phone. Not playing words with friends. That doesn't count towards the eight hours or the 24 hours. But go, go somewhere. Spend that time with your family. Try to, you know, eat things that are at home. Um, and sometimes in the city, I know this stuff is hard. Anybody have a roommate that makes this impossible, the whole Sabbath experiment? Anybody? You don't have to point to your roommates, but I know some of you have roommates. And so, and then here's what I would love to see us accomplish or try to get after once a year to get away for at least two nights for an extended time. There's great cabins and lodging type areas. Um, that's my idea of camping. I know some of you are tent people, whatever. Um, I'm, I'm going to try it one day. Um, as long as I get a you know, backup plan, I uh, know where the keys are. Um, but there are places, especially around the Bay Area, that you can get to that actually don't have TVs in the rooms, different things like that, and just be able to be out in creation, use it as an extended time, and, and prepare yourself ahead of time, asking God, God, during this time, would you fill me up with yourself? God, would it be a reminder that my world isn't going to fall apart? God, would it be a reminder that I'm not keeping the earth spinning? I'm not, that's not my job, it's your job. And it's just, God, would you fill me up? Listen to what Barton said in one other quote, and, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. He says, the point of this kind of thing, the point of the Sabbath is to honor our need for a sane rhythm of work and rest. It is to honor the body's need for rest, the spirit's need for replenishment, and the soul's need to delight itself in God for God's own sake. That phrase, for God's own sake, what she's saying is, hey, don't delight yourself in who God is and communing with Him just so you get something. Do it just because of who He is. And for most of us, if we were honest this morning, it's been a long time since we've delighted or been in conversation or communication with God just because of who He is. It's not that God doesn't want us to bring the things we want and need to Him. He does. But sometimes God just wants us to bring ourselves to Him. And He has this incredible commitment of bringing Himself to us. So much of religion really kind of goes right in line with how many of us live our lives, right? This thought that if you do X amount of things, then the gods will be appeased. And some of us would prefer that at times. That's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of Christianity. This God says, hey, I'm not asking you to do something for me so you get to me. I'm, I'm telling you I've done something for you so that you can come to me. We can't perform our way into it. We can't do enough to get into it. And that's, this is what God offers us. He wants to replenish us. You see, Martha thought so many things were necessary, and so do we. We think that here's what's necessary in our life, our financial security, and it is somewhat, right? And our status, or our, our virtual lives, right? We won't even get in that one. Um, our entertainment, all these things that can be really good value adds to our life, but we give those things first priority, and all the while we're allowing the thing that Mary's enjoying to slip by. Because we have to produce. We need to do these things so that we have these outcomes. And Jesus is going, no, Mary's chosen what is good. She's chosen what's necessary. She's chosen the good portion and it will not be taken away from her. How do you need to reorder your life? The person you think has to have that email as soon as you get it, guess what you're going to do if you continue doing that? They're going to constantly expect that from you. Let them go a couple days the first time. Four days, some are like, oh, now I see why the pastor hasn't communicated with me. Listen, though you, we can't see it on the outside, some of your souls are starving for this. They're dying. It's like being thirsty in a desert, and I'm trying to go, listen, this sounds crazy, but I think, I, I think this is what we need. I think it's what I need, and again, I talk about the things I struggle with, so you guys can hold me to it. Here's one other thing that's true. Some of you say, and you have to be asking the question, Ben, you don't understand what I do. If I start doing things like this, my productivity is going to go way down. Now, I want to bet you. I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to bet you. We'll talk about that probably. I'm willing to bet you that your productivity will go up. Because here's why. God didn't create rest and work to be enemies of each other. He created them to work in harmony together. And here's why God's plan is that we would rest from our work and that we would work from our rest. Right? And I believe that you and I, and again, I don't always live by this. In fact, some that know me well would say, Ben, that, that would be a new one if you began to live this way. I, I believe that we can actually be more productive and more fruitful 
when we actually allow God to do some things with our soul. And at the end of the day, this is the only thing that can sustain us, I think, for eternity. Let's get on that path now. Let's go, you know what, God, I think this is necessary. There are a lot of things, and you know this, because of who you are, most of us, because of where you live, and because of what you do, and how long you've been doing it like this, this will be radically different change for us. The question is, can you value it enough to fight for it, as things begin to come against it even today? Let me pray for us. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to celebrate communion together, which I think is really apropos of what we're talking about this morning. What communion does symbolically at the table as we get the bread and, and, and the juice this morning, what it does symbolically, it says that, that we're here just to be with God, to receive Him into our souls. And as we take the bread, which is His body, we dip it into what represents His blood. It's the idea that we are taking Christ in. And so, as you guys um, get ready to celebrate communion, what we'll do is we'll just, you can just walk down the center aisle, get in line, and, and then um, our, a couple of our leaders, Minnie and Uche, they will serve you guys um, the bread and the cup, and, and you'll be able to just celebrate in that moment. So the band's going to do two songs after our prayer, and you'll have that length of time to be able to sit, reflect, think through, or go ahead and get up and, and receive the elements this morning, and they'll continue to play until, until that's done. So, God, I'm very grateful this morning. God, I'm very grateful that, though this is not my tendency, it's not my tendency to pause. God, it isn't my tendency to create margin. God, it's all of our tendencies, at least most in this room, to be doers. God, I pray that we would value enough the daily time that we can have with you. God, the unhindered, maybe weekly time, and the even more extended monthly and, and quarterly and yearly. God, I, I pray that we would be willing to at least try this experiment. And then to be honest, how do we feel? Do we want, I, I got my, my, my guess is that we'll actually want more of it, not less of it, once we really are able to, to be in the rhythm of enjoying that. God, as we come to the table that you've invited us to now, I pray that we would celebrate well what you've done for us, Jesus. You didn't ask us to do for you. You did for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. We celebrate that this morning. God, if someone in this room doesn't know you as their sacrifice, God, I pray that would be um, just a new reality for them, even in this moment. God, I thank you for what you're doing in hearts this morning. I pray that we would adhere to what one thing is really necessary. In Jesus' name, amen.